Get your Bible or your phone with you. Turn to Mark chapter 4 is where we'll be. It'll also be on the screen behind me in a few minutes. Pastor Matt is back for vacation, so buckle up. I am ready to roll, right? We're on our new series called The Unknown, talking about the fears that we deal with in our life. We'll be talking about fears the next few weeks. Uh, Next week, I'll be talking about the fear of missing God's will. I don't know what you think about God's will, but I know a lot of people are fearful that they're going to make the wrong decision. They're going to come to a fork in the road, and the left way is going to be a, a life of blessing and what God wants, and the right way is utter destruction and ruin. And so they're standing in fear of getting it wrong, and I am going to destroy that theology next week. So come back. It's going to be fun to talk about that fear of missing God's will. Uh, I don't know if you can remember being a kid. Some of you have children in the room. Uh, I have conversations on a weekly basis with my kids about their monsters being under their bed, right? Two conversations this week with my three-year-old and four-year-old that I come in, and Dad, I, I heard something, there's a monster in my bed. And I don't know if you've ever tried to reason with a three-year-old, but it's extremely difficult, right? So what do you do is you turn on the light and you say, hey, let's look under your bed, there's nothing there. And when I turn off the light, there's still not going to be anything there. And what do they do? They look at you and say, okay, just leave the light on then, right? That, that's a way to, to, to solve this. And you're trying to rationalize with them. You're trying to tell them that you're, you're, you're scared and you're fearful of something that doesn't really exist and never will exist. How many know as we get older as adults, it may not be a monster under our bed, but we're still, feel, still fearful of what doesn't exist. We're fearful of the unknown. We're fearful of, of the what ifs. And we create things in our, in our head sometimes. This could happen. And, and I, I can't control these scenarios. What if this happens in my life? Uh, this past week, uh, my family, we went on vacation, and we have some family that own a house in the, the mountains of Colorado, so at the end of July, we go with our family every year. It's absolute chaos uh, with all these kids running around, and so we usually break it up. We go into two days on the way there, and so we'll go halfway, spend that night in a hotel with four small children, which is a lot of fun, and then we drive the rest of the way the next day. And then on the way home, we're like, you know what, let's just bite the bullet and drive all the way home. And so here, here's, here's the map of our drive home. This was Tuesday of this week, right? So we started in Breckenridge, Colorado. We ended in Tulsa, Oklahoma. That's about an 11-hour, nine-minute drive, unless you have four small children, and then you can double that, right? Because everybody has to pee about every five minutes. And so we're, we're on this drive. I was just going to be honest with you, like we wake up in the morning, my wife and I, and we're like, can we do this? Like this, and, and, and you're fearful of what, what might happen, like our one, one-year-old might just, you know, have a blowout, right? You know, and so, you know, the, the three-year-old's going to have to pee every 30 minutes, we know that, and just all these scenarios of like what could, the, the what ifs, and honestly, we were doing really good on Tuesday. No bad weather, drive was good, I mean, we, we actually made it like two hours at a time before peeing and stuff. And so and we're going and we're doing pretty well until we get about two hours outside of Tulsa. So we're on I-35 here, uh, going through the town of Blackwell, Oklahoma, on I-35, I don't even know where Blackwell is. Uh, and and we, we, we start to lose control. Like I can see it coming. Like our one-year-old is already there. He's like, man, I'm done. Like I've been in this car seat too long and he starts crying. There's nothing that we can do to get him to stop. We're throwing food at him. It doesn't work, right? And so our three-year-old is like, okay, I need to lay down. I'm tired. This is over. And so I'm sitting, I'm driving. I'm like, okay, we can either just tough this out the next two hours or we can pull over, regroup, try to finish strong. I'm like, you know what? Let's pull over. Let's regroup. Let's get some food. And so I see over the corner of my eye, there's a Brahms and a McDonald's, um, not two of our favorite choices, but we pull in Brahms, par- or excuse me, McDonald's parking lot, and, and we're, we're sitting there, and I tell Lindsay, I was like, get everybody's pajamas out, start putting jammies on everybody, I'm going to go in, get a bag of burgers, I'm going to come back out, we're going to regain control, we're going to finish strong, babe, we're going to do this, right? And so she has got kids out of her car, they're like playing in a vacant lot next to the McDonald's, because <laughs> we've been in the car for a long time. And so she's like putting jammies on outside of the minivan. And uh, I go in, I get a bunch of burgers, and then as their jammies are on, I'm like, here, take this burger, buckle in, eat it, right? Here, take this burger, buckle in, eat it. And I'm just doing this with all of our kids, right? And there are people driving by in, in the drive through line, right? And they're watching us do this. I don't know if you knew this, but it takes a lot for people to judge you at McDonald's, right? <laughs> I mean, I'll take a quarter pounder with cheese and McFlurry, large fries. Oh my God, what are they doing with their kids over there, Right? <laughs> I can't believe that they would just dress them in the parking lot. But if you are in our shoes, we do not care at that moment. It is all about getting home. It it is the fear of of the unknown that drives us. Uh, I was reading some interesting things this week about fear. Um, Psychologists say there are two basic fears that everybody is born with. Two basic fears. It's the fear of falling and the fear of loud noises. 
So no one has to teach a baby or a kid about those two fears. We're like, we are innately born with those. But all other fears are learned. I found that interesting. All other fears are learned. So you have to learn to, be, to have a fear of failure. You have to learn to have a fear of losing control, a fear of your future, a fear of not having enough, a fear of something happening to you. As I begin to look through these lists of, of psychiatric disorders, I realize most of them are phobias or fears. Most of them are, are, are irrational fears that we have about something. I, I don't know if you knew this. I, I didn't. Did you know that one in seven people suffer from coulrophobia? Coulrophobia. An abnormal fear of clowns, right? How many of you have that? Abnormal fear of clowns? Anybody in the room? Thank you for your honesty, Right? This is a true story. Um, in Sarasota, Florida, uh, city officials des- decided that they were going to put up 70 um, lifelike looking clowns all around their city, right? And, and they, they put out this big announcement about all these clowns that were going to go around the town. They had such lashback from doing this phone calls, in person protests, because coulrophobia is a real thing, and one in seven people have it, right? An abnormal fear of clowns. Anybody ever seen the movie It by Stephen King? That ruined me forever with clowns. Do not watch it. I mean, I couldn't see Bozo the Clown without thinking that guy's up to something, right? <laughs> He's up to something. It's just freaky. It's weird. They're actually bringing that movie back next year. I will not, not be watching it. Chorophobia. Some of the most common phobias, and some of you probably have some of these, and uh, you can nudge your neighbor if you know that your spouse does or something like that. Common phobias, heights, suffocation, driving in bad weather, the dark, Bridges, snakes, and we all said amen, right? Needles, terrorism, germs, vomiting, drowning, crowds. And here are actually my favorite uh, of, of the top, my top three of all the, all the favorites. Paper cuts, right? Str- struggle is real for some of y'all, I know. <laughs> Baldness, right? And dentists are some of the top phobias. I mean, you know, some fear is healthy. There are some healthy fears. There's a healthy fear in children that says, you know what, don't walk into the street. Don't walk off that cliff. But how do we know that most of the fear in our lives is unhealthy? It keeps us trapped. It it, it keeps us from living this life of faith and and peace and trust and joy. If you've got your your Bible, Mark chapter 4 is what what we're going to look at. It's a pretty famous story, very short story here. You see something in the Gospel of Mark that he shows us that Jesus does often. Jesus will will work incredibly hard. He'll minister to the crowds. He'll love people, and then he will retreat. He'll go alone to be with God and to pray. And you see this pattern uh, time and time again of ministry, retreat, prayer, ministry, retreat, prayer, ministry, retreat, prayer. He does it over and over again because it's the only way that he's going to sustain his ministry is to get away. In this specific scenario, we see that he's ministering to the crowds, and he looks at his disciples, and he says, hey, you know what, let's get in the boat, let's go to the other side, let's retreat, let's do something that they would often do. Let's read the story, Mark chapter 4, verse 35. He says, that day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. They get in a boat with Jesus, and out of nowhere, a storm comes up. Now, it's interesting because Matthew, in the Gospel of Matthew, he also tells this story. And if you look in the Greek, and I'd never seen this before until I was reading it this week, that Matthew uses the phrase seismos. And why that's significant is because the word seismos means this, a quake, a trembling eruption of sky and sea. There's only two other times in the New Testament, and it's around the crucifixion and resurrection where the word seismos is used. So what it tells us is this is not just a little thunderstorm, right? This is not just like, oh, we've got some white caps, right? This is, no, this is a seismos. This is an eruption of sky and sea. This is a bad, bad storm. And I I can't remember ever being in a boat during a horrible storm, and I, I bet some of you maybe have, but most of you probably haven't. 
A lot of you, if you've ever flown on an airplane much, you can probably, you've probably been in a plane when you hit really, really bad turbulence. Uh, I know I've been in a plane two times that I know of that the turbulence was so horrible that it's not just like, oh, buckle your seatbelt, right? There's going to be some turbulence. It was like people are gripping their chairs. They are repenting out loud, right? You're like, you think God's grace is sufficient, but just in case you're going to go ahead and repent because of things you think you might have done, right? Have you ever been in a plane when that happens? I mean, your, your blood pressure rises. I mean, your heart rate goes up. That is what's happening in this moment. I mean, they, they are fearful for their life. And I don't know about you, but when I get in a boat with Jesus, I would think the story would go something like this. You know what? A beautiful rainbow just appeared in the sky. This dove just fluttered down and just sat right there on, on the end of the boat, and it was so beautiful, right? I looked over the, the, the sea, and it was just a glass as far as you can see because Jesus is sleeping in the boat, right? Jesus is in the boat, so it's got to be easy. I was on a, a flight just a few weeks ago, and uh, I, I saw someone in the corner of my eye. They said, Pastor Matt, I looked back. It was a young lady in our church, and she just said to me in, in passing right as I was getting on the plane, she's like, I'm just really glad to know that my pastor's on this plane. <laughs> and the first thing that came to my mind was like, you know what? This plane can go down with me on it too, but I, I, I didn't say that to her, right? Because she was fearful. It's the same in the scenario. The, the disciples are thinking, Jesus is on this boat, Right? Sometimes we think to ourselves, we assume that life with Jesus will involve no storms. It will be security, comfort, and yet Jesus was not immune to storms himself. In fact, Jesus was a lightning rod for, for conflict. That's what led him to the cross. In John chapter 16, verse 33, he tells us, in this word, world, you're going to have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. So he guarantees that to them, doesn't he? He says, you're, you're, you're going to have trouble. And this is really important. I hope you don't miss this. What happens on this boat in the midst of this horrible storms, the waves begin to go over the side of the boat. The disciples don't know what to do. They're terrified for their life. They don't ask Jesus, Jesus, can you still the storm? Jesus, are you capable of doing something? They don't ask him, Jesus, are you aware that it's storming outside right now? You're sleeping down hard. Are you aware of what's going on? Can you not feel something is different, Right? They go to Jesus and they ask him this question. Jesus, don't you care? Don't you care? If you're taking notes, there's a few things I want you to know about fear. Number one is this. Fear corrodes our confidence in God's goodness. It corrodes our confidence in God's goodness. God, do you sleep during my storm? God, are your eyes closed when I'm walking through my valley of the shadow of death? Do you, are you concerned whenever I'm, I'm going through this and you seem to be sleeping? God, do you care? See, fear unleashes a swarm of doubt inside of us. And what it does is it turns us into control freaks. Because fear at its center is a perceived loss of control. And when life begins to spin out of control, we grab on to what we can manage. And we say to God, you know what? If you're going to sleep, if you're not going to do anything, then I am. And I'm going to take control of the situation, and I'm going to do what I need to do to manage the situation, because you obviously don't give a rip. You obviously are just going to let me walk through this. You obviously took a day off today. And I'm going to take control, and I'm going to manage. Number two, if you're taking notes, when fear shapes our lives, control and safety become our gods. Control and safety. Anything that involves a risk, we're not willing to do. And we live imprisoned, trapped in our fear of the unknown and the what ifs and what could happen in our life. If faith equals a life of freedom, fear equals living trapped in doubt. Fear makes us forget. We forget so easily. Number three is this if you're taking notes, fear gives us spiritual amnesia. It dulls our miracle memory. We can no longer remember what God's done. We no longer remember how good he's been to us. We no longer remember the times he showed up in our lives again and again. We zoom in on the moment and we just assume that, you know what, God may have been with us last year, but he's abandoned us today. God is not here in this moment or I would not be in this storm 
right? That's what we think in our heads. That's what we rationalize. And our worst selves come out in fear. I don't know if you ever realized this, but your worst self will come out when you're fearful. You will do things and say things and rationalize things. You will go to some dark, dark places when your life is controlled by fear. There's a story uh, of a guy named Martin Niemöller. He grew up in Germany during the rise of the, the Nazi regime. And Martin Niemöller was a pastor. He was a spiritual leader. And a lot like most of them that grew up in Germany during that time, again, the Nazi regime was kind of this radical arm that grew up, but no one knew what, what Hitler was capable of doing. And so he actually sided with the Nazi regime early on, and then he began to see where it was going and what was taking place. And Martin Niemöller had to decide, am I going to continue to, to, to be on board with something that's obviously killing, uh, unjustly killing people? And, he, and obviously he jumped off board during that time and he began to lead the confessional church. It was an underground church movement in Germany with guys like Diedrich Bonhoeffer and things of that nature. And he began to write manuscripts and, and a lot of things that we can still read today of the journey that he went on during that time. And in one of his, his journals, he, he, he wrote this. When his wife asked him what he had learned about Hitler, he said these words, I discovered that Herr Hitler is a terribly frightened man. I've discovered that he's a terribly frightened man. See, fear releases the tyrant within us. Racism that we still uh, battle today exists because of fear born in the lives of people. Dictators and violence in our worst selves originate in fear. See, fear-filled people cannot love another person deeply. They can't do it. They don't risk They won't give to the poor. They can't dream wildly. They are trapped in this idea of what could happen and trying to manage and control every circumstance around them, every scenario they find themselves in, so fearful of what could be. And I can only imagine the disciples going down below the boat. Jesus, don't you care? Don't you care? That we're in this storm. See, I think all of this was, was premeditated. This is my opinion. I think Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. I think Jesus got into the boat, knowing what was going to happen, thinking this is an incredible opportunity to test the faith of the disciples, to show them something. He goes down, grabs a sack that they use to weigh the side of the boats as a pillow, lays his head down, and goes to sleep like a baby, knowing what's about to happen. Jesus, don't you care? Jesus gets up, rebukes the winds, and says to them, quiet, be still. Looks at his disciples and says, why are you so afraid? Why are you so fearful? Why don't you have faith? See, you had faith when the waters were calm, when everything was still. But now that you're in this raging sea, you have no faith. So you assume that I'm only in control when you're living in peace, when things are good. But when the water becomes over the edge of your boat, now I'm no longer on the throne. Now I'm no longer in control. Can I just tell you, anybody can have faith when the seas are calm? It takes very little effort to have faith when everything is going well. But can you trust in the goodness of God when all hell is breaking loose around you? When your boat is being swamped again and again and again? And Jesus looks at him and says, why don't you have faith? Why don't you believe? You only believe in my goodness when your scenarios line up with what you want. And as soon as they don't, I'm no longer on the throne of your life. And how many know we're all guilty of that? We're all guilty of that. Did you know God's most frequent command in Scripture? God's most frequent command in Scripture is not have no other gods before me. It's not the Ten Commandments. It's not even love one another, love God. Uh, above anything else. All these are great commands are in Scripture, but over 300 times explicitly in Scripture, God says, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Do not fear. I've learned something about fear. Fear and and worry are usually always married. They always come in pairs. And so where there is fear, there will be worry. And if some of you are honest in the room, that's something you deal with. You are a worrier. 
You have, a, you have this uh, innate capacity sometimes to your mind to wonder and go to places that the what ifs, the what could happen. The glass is always a little bit half, half empty, right? And this could happen. I want to read this passage to you, and I'm going to read, I'm going to read this passage rather slowly. I want, I want you to listen to the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 6. He says this. He says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying at a single hour to, a, to your life? And why do you worry about your clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today, and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans, I want you to read this, the pagans, those who do not know God, those who live like there is no God, those who have no concept that there is a good, loving Father, for the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need Him, need them, but seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Again, in Matthew chapter 6, at the very last passage, Jesus tells us, you know what, tomorrow will we'll bring its own troubles. In this world, you're going to have trouble. But Jesus is guaranteeing time and time again, it's not the absence of trouble. If you're waiting for the absence of trouble to develop faith or develop your theology or your understanding of God, you're going to be waiting forever. You're going to become bitter and cynical and hard-hearted because you're waiting for the circumstances of life to dictate your faith. He says, in this world, you're going to have trouble. It's not the absence of storms that set us apart as followers of Jesus. It's that we have this different perspective of them. We have a different perspective on life. We don't zoom in on the scenario and say, you know what? This has to dominate and dictate my life. We zoom out and say, you know what? God is bigger. We have life. We have hope. We have eternity. And let me tell you, in your fight against fear, there will be two different perspectives, two, two different perspectives that are at work. There is an enemy, Satan, who wants to destroy your life. He wants to kill, steal, and destroy you. He wants to use whatever tactics possible to bring you down, let me tell you what the enemy's plan is. He wants you to be so focused on the future, not the real future as defined by God's promises, but an imaginary future that is defined by your fear. The enemy wants you to focus on this imaginary future that does not exist. He wants you to focus on the what ifs. He wants you to live in constant fear that something might happen, or this could happen, or the worst possible scenario. You ever watch those shows of those doomsday prepper people who build like the, the underground thing and, and get like 20 years of food and are just like, it's going to happen tomorrow, tomorrow? That's what Satan wants to do to you in your life. This irrational fear that, you know what, I, I, I don't know if I can continue to move on. It's going to dictate everything, every decision I make. That's what the enemy wants to do to you. The what ifs, a fear that locks you up. Let me tell you what the Father let me tell you what God wants from you. He says, I care for all my creation, even the birds. The birds don't take antacids, right? They're not sitting around like, you know, where's my food going to come from? What are... And yet I take care of them. You are created in my image. You are my sons and my daughters. How much more will I take care of you? This is the game-changing idea right now, and I, and I hope that you don't miss this concept. Here is what God is saying. Here's what Jesus is saying in this passage in Matthew chapter 6. Here's what the key to unlocking a life of joy and freedom and faith. Jesus says, you know what, today I'm going to give you all the grace that you need to make it. I'm not going to give you the grace today that you're going to need to tomorrow. You know what I'm going to do tomorrow when you wake up? I'm going to give you the grace tomorrow 
that you're going to need to overcome the troubles and the trials and the tribulations you're going to face tomorrow. And you know what I'm going to do on Wednesday? On Wednesday when you wake up, I'm going to give you the grace and I'm going to provide for you and I'm going to give you what you need. So when it's Monday, you're not going to worry about Wednesday because Wednesday I'm going to give you what you need on Wednesday. On Monday, I'm going to give you what you need for today. If you're taking notes, the last two things are this. Number one is this, fear of tomorrow kills our faith for today. Fear of tomorrow will kill your faith. It will destroy your joy. It will rob you of your peace. Rob you of the life God intended. Number two is this, faith for today will kill our fear for tomorrow. Faith of a loving God who is in control, who doesn't take time off, who is not uh, distant in the midst of our calamities, that kind of God is the God that you serve. And that faith in him today will kill the fear that you have of the future. It will squash the unknowns in your life that dictate and dominate your life. God wants you to walk in faith, faith for today, the grace he's going to give you today. See, Jesus isn't condemning the concern for responsibilities or planning for the future. Jesus isn't saying, spend all your money today because I'm going to give you all all your money back tomorrow. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying in this passage is this. He's dismissing this mindset of people who think, you know what, I'm not present. I'm not good. I'm not able to provide. Jesus is saying, I am. I am. And I'm going to give you the grace that you need each and every day of your life. My grace will be sufficient for you. Some of you right now, you have things coming up that you're fearful about. I'm fearful about my kids, where they're going, they're starting school, what's going to happen to them. I'm fearful of the unknowns, a job, a move. I'm fearful of finances, the what ifs. I'm fearful of a relationship. And you live in that fear of something that doesn't exist. And Jesus is telling us right now in Matthew 6, don't live in that fear. Trust in my grace and my ability to provide for you every day. I'm going to give you enough today and I'm going to give you what you need tomorrow but here's the kicker and here's what you have to understand is the how here's what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6 at the very end he says pagans run after trying to get all these things but not you you know who you are you know you're a son and daughter of God you know he's going to provide for you so you don't run like they do here's what you do in verse 33 he says but seek first his kingdom, and his righteousness. And all these things, all the things that you need to sustain you, to help you move forward will be given to you. Seek first the kingdom of God. We could sit here for hours and talk about the implications of seeking first the kingdom of God. You know what the kingdom of God is? It's something we're experiencing partially right now because of what Jesus has done, but it's something we are awaiting one day when Christ returns. That's why we don't live as the world lives. We don't mourn as the world mourns. We don't look at scenarios like the world looks at scenarios because we have a hope that is bigger than our temporary, momentary struggle. And Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the things that matter, not the things that don't matter. Don't seek out the temporary thing. Seek out the things that are going to live on forever. Put your hope and your trust in something bigger than where you find yourself right now. Because God is a God of the storm. And he's a God of the calm. And we can't just have faith when the boat is not rocking. When the the, the sea is glass. I mean, we have to have faith when the waves begin to go over the side. And we're looking around and we're thinking, this wasn't on my five-year plan. This wasn't how it was supposed to go. God did not take a day off. God is intimately involved in your life. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me. I want to pray for us this morning. Holy Spirit, right now, I I just ask, God, would you bring to our minds right now the fears that are controlling us, the irrational fears of the unknown, of things that we create a lot of times that are controlling us, that are locking us up, God, make us self-aware right now to know what that is. The things that are trying to trap us from living the life that you intended us to live. That we can have joy and peace in the midst of life's most difficult storms. 
because we are focused on something more, something bigger. With every head bowed, every eye closed right now, I'm not going to embarrass you in this room, but I do want to pray for those individuals right now. And there is a fear that dictates your life. It overwhelms you at times. It keeps you up at night. It robs your joy. It steals your peace. And and I just want to give it to God this morning. With no one else looking around, every head bowed, every eye closed, if that's you and there's some fear in your life, would you just lift your hand right now? A ton of people. Okay, you can put your hands down. I want you to put that fear right now at at the front of your mind. We're going to give it to God. We are going to lay it on the altar. We're no longer going to let that thing drive us. We're going to trust in the goodness of God. No matter what we see, we're going to trust that God is good, that He is on the throne. And we're going to rest today in Him. Father, right now, God, we lay these fears. God, all these fears. God, that the enemy tries to trap us with, tries to to trap us with these ideas and thoughts, the what ifs, the what could happen. God, these things that aren't even real, God, that keep us from living the life that you want us to live, God, we give them to you today, God. God, we don't have all the answers, the remedies, God, but we just trust you. God, we know that you're good. God, I pray for, for some people right now who are walking through a storm, like the waves are beginning to come over the edge of the boat. God, would you give them the faith in the midst of the storm to know that you aren't asleep, you didn't take the day off, you are in control, that you see every movement, God. Let you be our hope. God, I pray right now that the enemy will not control us with fear. Not going to control us with fear. That we replace that. We, we freely let go of that and we replace it with your peace, with your love, with your joy. And knowing that every day, God, you're going to give us the grace that we need. Every day, When we come to you, when we seek first the kingdom, you're going to give us the grace we need. And I speak that over every person in this room in Jesus' name. Amen.